Hey guys, it's Emily. Welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to be digging into some novels I recently read about generations of complex women. It's actually the beginning of a new series that I'm doing here on my channel, uh, which is basically it, it, tentatively titled Essay Notes. So the idea is that, um, you know, I've read some books that I think have some similar topics that, you know, if I were in college and I read these in a class, I would want to write an essay about them. So basically what I've done here is just kind of compiled some notes that were I in college, I would turn into an essay. These are just some preliminary ideas that I had. Um, I haven't specifically come to any big grand conclusions, uh, just kind of some, some preliminary thoughts, like I said. So um, I think it's fun. <laughs> it's a cool way of, you know, writing an essay without having to actually write the essay. Um, maybe that's a bit lazy, but um, I also just like, I think it's it's interesting to look at these these overlapping like topics and themes and just kind of seeing how they work within each story. Future videos may be a little bit different about what they deal with, but the basic idea is that I took some notes on some books I read and I want to talk about it, but I don't want to fully, you know, do a nice well thought out essay. I just want to discuss it with you a little bit. So let's dig into some notes I wrote on Practical Magic, Plain Bad Heroines, and The Vanishing Half, and how these books deal with generations of complex women. And just a warning, I, there's going to be spoilers. I, there's no way for me to like really talk thoroughly about how all these books deal with this topic and this theme without spoiling them. So if you haven't read them, I'm sorry. <laughs> read them and come back. We're going to start off with Practical Magic. So just a heads up, I can't talk about this one without also talking about the movie and how they're similar. So just, yeah, that's just how it's going to be. I mean, most of you probably knew about the movie before you knew about the book. I mean, that's how I was. I didn't even know it was based on a book until recently. So this book kind of was already going to be at a disadvantage because I love the movie, but I, I did enjoy it for what it was. It is, I will say, different than the film if you've seen it. It's not bad, but I do think that the movie does better with the story. So let's go ahead and talk. It is the story of two sisters who come from a long line of magical women. They go to live with their aunts after their parents die, but they never truly feel at home there. Eventually they leave, they take separate paths, but they're forced to come back together when one of them gets into some serious trouble. The book begins a lot like the film. It pretty much starts in the same place. When I was reading it, I was like, oh, this is, this is gonna be like the same story. I was wrong. Um, but you know, you have their parents dying, they're going to live with their aunts in this town that hates them because they're witches. You know, Sally is the studious one, Jillian's the wild one, but as children, they're very close. So uh, it really diverges after the death of Sally's husband. In the movie, you see Sally returning to her aunt's house after this death, but in the book, she leaves. She takes her children away. She doesn't want them to have anything to do with magic. She thinks that magic is like ruining her life. And that's another thing about the book is that the magic is less overt. You know, it's it's much more subtle, little things here and there, you know, not like big magical, powerful spells happening all the time, which I think is valuable. I just don't know that it necessarily works with this story. I think maybe it could have had some other things gone a little different and I'll get into that. So the book focuses a lot more on the conflict that develops between Sally, Jillian, and then Sally's two daughters, Antonia and Kylie. <laughs> Antonia and Kylie who are swapped uh, in the movie. I believe Kylie is the older one but in the book she's the younger one. I don't know why but Sally's daughters in the book are actually teens so we see them dealing with some like definitely some older issues and that you know causing some issues with Sally and Jillian and then it, it's just a whole whole mess. So we've got a lot of animosity between Jillian and Sally and that's spurred on by the Sally's daughters and the issues that they're going through and how that connects and you know it is it is a lot but it is also supposed to be spurred on by the death of the Jimmy Angelo character. I'm not sure if that is his name in the books, but that is his name in the movie. So he is causing some animosity, but it just feels like so much and it's just so hateful all the time. It's it's a lot. I didn't love that. There's just so much hate. I mean, Sally really seems to hate Jillian. Even with 
you know, everything that's going on with the magical aspect of it because we're so much more disconnected from the magic. It just feels like such an intense reaction. And I was like, this doesn't seem founded in much of anything. I don't know. It just kind of didn't really work for me. Even if, you know, maybe it does mostly make sense. It just felt really bad to read and I didn't like it. So let's look more at the generational aspect of practical magic, starting with the ants who are really not extremely present in this book. They're way more present in the movie, even though we do have them leave at a certain point in the movie. Um, in the book, we lose them pretty early and they don't come back until the end, um, which I think is definitely a detriment to the book. The reason that we end up losing them in the book is because Sally and Jillian feel like they are a burden on their aunts. They feel like their aunts never really wanted to raise them, especially Jillian. She doesn't even see her aunts again until the end of the book. It's been years and years and years, but she has always felt like they didn't really want her around. And then Sally leaves because she feels like her aunts are too connected to magic and magic is ruining her life and it has killed her family and her husband and everything. So she just wants to get away from it. So you have both of the girls leaving and that's why the book takes place away from the aunts. You just don't really see them. Um, and I definitely think it would have been stronger had we had more interaction with the ants. I think having them around would have been made for a better story than just this angry, volatile story that we get with Sally and Jillian and Sally's daughters. It's just, it's so angry. And I don't think that, you know, they don't, they wouldn't have conflict with the ants, but I just, I think the ants bring a sense of magic and fun to the story that we lose by having them. And I will admit that I might only be saying this because I've seen the film and in the film the ants are always there. We have that fun margarita scene, but I think it's valid when you have a representation that you appreciate more to have that criticism. I mean, with that margarita scene, you see that bond that they have with their ants. And even so, you can see right after that the ants leave because they've messed up. And so you still see some of that conflict and I don't know it just I think it's it would have been better it didn't have to be the same necessarily but to have the ants there to see more of that relationship so Jillian and Sally the animosity between them and the books is just off the charts and I know I've already like talked about it a little bit but it just doesn't really make sense to me that uh, there would be that much there for the presence of Jimmy Angelo to build upon because it, as kids they had a good relationship I believe the book tells us that and then whenever Sally is going through her de depressed period after her husband dies Jillian will call her every week to talk to her and I know that you know them being separated and not seeing each other as often and you know maybe a little bit of resentment has built up but man they are just so mean and hateful and it sucks <laughs> And I think also in the book, we have Sally being so much more hateful towards magic. And I think just in general, a much more bitter character. And I think it just does her a disservice to have her be so mad and bitter and angry all the time. In the movie, we see her wanting to get away from magic, but she still has this open heart and she still wants to, you know, connect with her sister and help her. And I think in the book, she just resents the fact that Jillian even needs help and just is so angry towards her for bringing her anywhere near magic. She just is so, so mean and I don't get it. And then the whole thing with the guy coming in, it just, it seemed like it was better handled in the movie to me. I just liked Sally a lot more in the movie. Maybe I just like Sandra Bullock. That's probably it. <laughs> Moving on to Sally's daughters, Antonia and Kylie. They kind of always dislike each other. Antonia especially doesn't like when Kylie comes on the stage because she wants to be the center of attention. So we know that, you know, they've got this antagonistic relationship from the start. So their whole deal makes sense throughout the story whenever, you know, they're fighting or they're having, you know, issues or whatever. That, it makes sense to me. And yet it's not nearly as angry and hateful as Jillian and Sally. But then we do, towards the end, see them forming a bond over something that they share. And I personally, I don't have any sisters, so I don't know if this kind of 
uh, evolution is common or makes sense necessarily. But to me, it felt like some good storytelling for these characters specifically. And it made a lot more sense than what was going on with Jillian and Sally. I just don't get it. <laughs> and then there is one more important generational aspect, and that is the house. So this book begins with this house being described, and it's so quirky and magical and different, and then we leave it. <laughs> and I hate that. Um, in the movie, we are in this house the whole time, and it's such a cool house. It's such a cool setting, and I'm glad we get to live there in the movie. But in the book, Sally moves to this random suburb in New York, and it doesn't have that same feeling. It's just some random house that in my mind I'm just imagining like some suburban cutout that isn't as interesting at all. I just really hate that we lose this magical generational home that connects so much with all the characters and we don't even get it back at the climactic moment of the story. In the end uh, we have the ants coming to Sally's home in New York and you know one of the ants says oh well this is so cool. You've like built a life for yourself. Like you've done so well, but that really just doesn't, that doesn't make it worth it to me. I think there's a way that Sally could have returned home and they could have seen like, Hey, you have really done something here. I don't think we needed to have all this take place in this house in New York. I think we should have returned to their home that has this magical connection and have this all play out there. And they do all return at the end, but it just kind of feels like tacked on. I, it might have even been the epilogue. It just, like, it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, it does. Like, we get, you know, Jillian finally coming home, and that's important, but I think her having to do it to solve this problem that she's created and see that her aunts truly do love her and want to help her, um, I think it just, it, it would have made more sense. So the story ends with the women coming back together, finding their magic, and then in the very last few pages kind of just returning home and having, like, a nice time together and having them find their strength and their love for each other in that home I think just would have been so much more thematically pleasing. So let's talk about Plain Bad Heroine. This book kind of tells two separate stories. The first one is about uh, these young women in Hollywood making a movie. So uh, I believe it's Merritt, Audrey, and Harper are these young women who are making a movie about uh, a real life story about two girls who were in love at a boarding school and died. And so they're making a movie about that. And then we also have this story taking place in the past, but it's not about the girls that they're playing in the future. It's about two teachers at the school who are in a relationship, Libby and Alex. And their story is kind of just like them dealing with the outcome of the deaths of these girls and where things go from there and, you know, figuring out why they died and kind of having things converge on them. The novel also largely focuses on this book by Mary McLean, who was a bisexual feminist writer in the 1900s. I don't know much about her, but uh, her book is very important to the people in the book, but it's also kind of a MacGuffin and it's important in what it says, but it also ends up really not meaning much in the terms of the story. It ends up being a, a curse that was placed a long time ago that's really causing all of the things that are happening. And the book is still important, but they just this whole time are acting like it's the thing, the issue, and it's not. I kind of felt like the curse was weird because it was placed by a woman who was mad at men, but then it ends up being an issue for empowered women. And I don't really, the curse, honestly, the curse is gonna be something that's an issue. We're gonna talk about that. I will say that I did enjoy reading this book, but <laughs> it's really convoluted and doesn't make a ton of sense. So as much as I had a good time, um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's like really well structured. There is some good writing in there. It is a, a fun time, an interesting time, but maybe could have used a, a little bit more work. So basically we have this curse in this book that is said to be attached to this place, but also isn't really. It, it kind of begins affecting the girls before they even go to the place, and it just, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then at the end, it seems to stop after the descendant of Libby, who is one of the characters in our uh, 1900 storyline, 
dies, but then it also doesn't stop exactly. I'm, it's, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So, so these issues with this curse are something that we feel a lot with the generational aspect in the story. So let's just go ahead and get into that. So this is the only book I read where the generational aspect isn't familial. It is connected by this curse I was talking about. So this curse was set way, way back before even the 1900 storyline on the specific setting that we're going to be dealing with throughout the rest of the story. But uh, the woman who sets it isn't really necessarily related to any of the other women throughout the story, except for one who like kind of just appears at the end and doesn't isn't really well, you know, uh, what's the word? She isn't really well like thought out. She just kind of appears there and I don't really know who she is. But this woman sets this curse because this man wrongs her. And so this curse is, I believe, supposed to be on the land. And eventually we have our characters in the 1900s moving there and building their home and this school on this land. And so the curse starts to, you know, affect them. And that makes sense. You know, they move to this land. It, make, it makes some sense to me. But it also has this situation where there's women who are descended from the women of the, who placed the curse, I guess, getting involved in making them move there. And it's all just, it's, it doesn't make a ton of sense. So when it comes to these characters who moved there, we do get their descendants later on. So that's the only real familial aspect we have. We have Libby and then the character of Elaine in the present, who is an older woman who was descended from her. But that family line just isn't extremely well explained. Like I said, there's a character who comes in, I think it's Ava or something, who seems to be a part of this family, but what does she have to do with anything? It's never really clear. She just doesn't seem to have much of an impact on anything, and I don't really know why she's there. I feel like this connection between Libby, Ava, and Elaine could have been further explored, but it just wasn't, and that kind of left the book feeling lacking. And I do enjoy the focus on the young actresses and uh, the writer. It's two actresses and a writer that are um, involved in this film that they're making, but I think getting to know Elaine and her history and the gaps uh, in her family history, it would have made the story just feel more connected overall because the curse just isn't doing it. And it would have been more interesting if Elaine was more involved in the story. And I also had thought that maybe it would have been more interesting if the character of Merritt, who is the writer of the movie that they're producing, or she wrote the book of the movie that, she wrote the book that the movie is based on. So it would have been maybe more interesting if she had been descended from Libby, but she wasn't, so. We just, we don't really have that connection, and even though there is some familial stuff going on, it just doesn't really make sense, and it's very underexplored, very underdeveloped, and I think it could have added a lot more to the story. There's also the issue of the girls uh, in the movie, in the present time, playing these characters who are not at the forefront of the story in the past, which I think is a deliberate choice and I think it, there is some merit to it, but I think because we're doing this whole generational thing, it just kind of loses some of that connection because they're playing the younger girls who died in the past and we're dealing with these older women. It just, it, you, you don't have that same connection and it doesn't feel as important to have both of these stories being told together. It feels almost more like stories that should have been told separately or in a different way. And so these older women in the past relate to them really only in that they're both feeling the curse, but the way that the curse affects all of them is different and nonsensical. And like I said, the curse just, it, it doesn't have a good through line to connect all of these stories. So having that be the thing that connects both of them just doesn't really work. And ultimately their arc doesn't seem to have a whole lot of impact on our characters. I mean, once they finally get to the setting, so we begin with our present characters in Hollywood and then they eventually go to the setting of the school to film this movie. And once they get there, we do have a little bit more of like dealing with those characters, but it's just, they have so much more of a connection to the younger characters who are ultimately more symbolic. There's so much of a disconnect here that it, just doesn't make for a good generational story. So at the end of the book, the curse is seemingly done, but also not 
done. So um, we, in our, in our past storyline, we get it, you know, killing both of our uh, uh, heroines are, <laughs> yeah, the, the heroines in the past. It kills both of them. And then in the future, whenever the descendant of one of those characters dies, it seems to stop majorly affecting our present day characters, which why it, it's not a familial connection necessarily so why but then also it doesn't stop affecting them completely they at the end still talk about feeling it and you know having to deal with some of the repercussions like some of the physical actual things that were happening because of the curse so why are they still feeling it it's, it's just convoluted and over explained while also just being vague and not really making any sense so I know I, I sound like I hate this book. I really enjoyed reading it. It was very, very fun and enjoyable. But I just think when you take it to this level of analysis, it kind of falls apart. And so it's better enjoyed not analyzing it like this. It ultimately is just two very disconnected stories that didn't necessarily need to be told together. Pardon the interruption, but I just wanted to say that I specifically got this book off of my bookshelf to hold it up in this video. And then I got so stressed about losing the light and started rushing that I forgot completely about it. It's the only physical copy of one of these books that I have. The other two I listened to on audiobook. And yeah, it's it's sad. I'm I'm just a bad booktuber. I don't I'm I don't know how to booktube, so I guess I should just give up now. Just kidding. But I am I am sad. But here it is now. <laughs> how cute. Anyway, Back to the video. The Vanishing Half. So this book centers on Stella and Desiree, who are twin sisters that are black, but they are white passing. So Desiree, as she grows up, continues to identify as a black woman. She marries a black man. She ends up having a daughter who uh, has very, very dark skin and is very obviously black. Um, and then Stella decides to pass over and become a white woman. And she marries a white man, has a daughter who is very white she looks very white and you know she doesn't tell her family about her past and then the book goes on to follow both of their daughters and how their lives turn out differently because of where they've come from and how they were raised so the reasons i like this book so much um the writing is just above and beyond i think it is really really well written the novel also explores complex racial issues in a very nuanced way which is you know something i uh like having in my books. Plain Bad Heroines deals with uh, LGBTQ characters, but it doesn't really deal with issues surrounding that necessarily. So in this book, we get this very interesting story that's also um, examining these difficult topics. And I'm not trying to fault the other two books for not, you know, really taking on difficult issues. Plain Bad Heroines definitely had LGBTQ representation, but it wasn't really trying to say anything about that necessarily or look at issues related to that. It was just kind of like, look at all these women who are friends but also could be in relationships together and how fun that is. And it is a fun time. It doesn't really need to be more than that. And then Practical Magic is just about these two sisters who come from a magical family and are having some issues and they're dealing with it. And I'm not faulting either of these stories for what they are, but I can fault them for lacking in representation. I know that all the characters in Practical Magic are white and Plain Bad Heroines, I, I don't recall any of them being described as people of color. Ultimately, The Vanishing Half just sticks with me the most. Like I said, it's the most well-written um, and, it, and it is still entertaining even in dealing with these issues that it, you know, tackles. And it also does a really, really great job of doing this generational story. So let's just go ahead and get into the generational aspect. So let's start off with Stella and Desiree. These are our twins who... Uh, are both white passing and they are described as being very very similar so similar that you can't really tell them apart except for the fact that they have very different personalities one is very studious the other much more wild which is interesting because that was the sisterly dynamic we had in practical magic and i'm not sure if that's just a common trope that we're dealing with when it comes to sisters but uh, it is it is interesting to see it in both of these stories that deal with these generational aspects and how they're different personalities lead them in different directions. In both cases, we actually see the studious one really wanting to be the one to completely cut ties with their fami their family and their identity. Obviously, in Practical Magic, Jillian wanted to get away from her family, but she 
had no problem doing magic still. It was really Sally who wanted to get away from her family and wanted to get away from the magic that, you know, kind of identified them. And that's very similar to Stella in this book, who passes over, becomes white, completely leaves her family behind. So like I talked about earlier, Stella and Desiree both make very different decisions in their life that impact their daughters, Kennedy and Jude. So Kennedy is the daughter of Stella, who is white passing, and Jude is the daughter of Desiree, who is black. We obviously have one being born with the uh, easier identity of being white, and then Jude is very black, which even in the town they are from, is very difficult on her because everyone else in this town they are from is white passing, but Jude is very, very obviously black. And so that is an issue for her, even among a black community. Kennedy, on the other hand, doesn't have any idea about this history. So she just grows up as a young white girl in LA and um, it is completely her identity, even though she knows her mom is holding something back. So she has no problem fitting in, but she also knows that something is missing. So through these two girls, we see how the knowledge of your history and your ancestry can really affect your life and who you are. So Jude knows exactly who she is and where she comes from. And though she faces a lot of hardships, uh, once she grows up, she kind of really knows exactly who she wants to be. She starts studying medicine, she ends up going to medical school, and she has a very defined path. So Kennedy has never really understood who she is because her mother has never told her. So she doesn't have anything to necessarily hold on to. So we see her taking a much less defined path than she's just kind of floating around most of the time. She becomes an actor. In this, she can step into these roles where she is playing a much more defined character than she herself is. And I think that's probably comforting, but we still, you know, we still see her floating around. She doesn't have a lot of success in acting and she never really quite fits the way that she wants to, and I think that really speaks to her character. And even when Kennedy does find out about her past through meeting Jude and confronting her mother, she is still just, it doesn't fit with this person that she thought she was, and she just can't really reconcile that. And so through the end of the story, we just kind of see her floating, and, you know, there's no real resolution for that because you know, she's just been lied to her whole, whole life and she just doesn't really know who she is. I think it's also interesting that she deals with these generational issues through her acting because that is something we see in Playing Bad Heroines when one of the characters who is acting in the movie as one of the uh, girls who died in the 1900s, she kind of starts to feel the effects of that girl. And these are very different situations. I just think it's interesting how this generational aspect comes out in acting and how acting can kind of deal with that situation, I guess. Not a fully formed thought, but a thought. Lastly, I want to discuss the mother of Stella and Desiree and the town that they come from. So Odell raised them in this town that was created to be a haven for these, these people who weren't quite white, but they weren't quite black. And I think it's important that by the end of the story, we've kind of lost both of these things. Their mother has Alzheimer's and so by the end of the story she really doesn't remember them. And then the town they're from, Mallard, it was never really a specifically defined place by like the government. Eventually it's just incorporated into other townships and it becomes lost as its own entity. It just is part of other things. It's not this safe haven that it was necessarily. It's still, the town is still there, the people are still there, but the idea of the town is kind of lost at the end, which is important. So in the end, we do finally get Stella returning home. This whole time she passed over as white, she was completely denying her family, not seeing them at all. So when she's returning home, all of these things that she has been running from have slowly faded away. And all this history that she was trying to escape from just isn't actually really there anymore. And it is a little bit sad. But it is also important that in this story, we are returning to this space, even if it is not quite existing in the way that it did before, it is still there. And the fact that she is coming back and confronting her sister in this place is powerful because this is the connection that they share. This is where they were both raised. They both grew up. This is really the one of the last places they remember being together. And so having them confront each other in this place is important. And it is thematically pleasing to have this occur here. It just makes sense. So Unlike Practical Magic in this story, um, the sisters don't stay together after this reunion. It's just one night and then it's over and they don't have this, this big coming back together. And you can see that from 
the way that everything that they once had is just kind of gone. Even though she still is able to return to this place, it's just not the same. And even the sisters who were once described as looking exactly alike look really different now because, you know, even before going, Stella dyed her hair so that the gray wouldn't be there and Desiree hasn't done that. And you can see the difference between them now. And that's how you know that it's just, it's not gonna last. So in this case, returning to the family home is a goodbye rather than a coming together. If we're still comparing it to practical magic, Sally was able to reclaim her magic and get back to that. But with Stella, she's dealing with this very real issue of race and having passed over. And it's not so easy to just have this new family that she has and try and reconcile that with this family that she once had. And I think that makes it so much more interesting that we're dealing with this very real issue and seeing that once you've made this decision, you can't just go back. It's not that easy. The reconciliation just, it, it can't really happen. And so really it's, it's a story about how you can't just go back to everything you've denied and left behind because once you've left it, you become a different person and it changes and it's, it's not the way that it used to be. All right, so now that we've kind of analyzed all of those stories, looked at their generational aspect, I have some final thoughts on what makes a successful generational story. So I think it's really important that there is a connection, a strong connection between the generations. Like I was talking about with Plain Bad Heroines, we just, we don't really have a strong connection. You know, you have the curse that is just kind of floating and doesn't really make a ton of sense. And the familial line just isn't really well defined. So in that book, you you have this lack of connection. And so the generational stories just can't come together. And like I said, maybe if Merritt had been descended from our past characters or Elaine had been more of a focus, or maybe if we had just shifted from our past characters being the older women to the younger women that our uh, present day characters are playing, maybe all of that would have made that connection stronger. But really it's just it's very lacking and i think it's important that this is the only story that doesn't have that strong familial connection throughout the generations and i think that is what really bolsters the other two in being generational stories when it comes down to it family is connected whether they want to be or not and i i think that really makes the other stories the other thing i think is important for a generational story is the setting so like i talked about with practical magic the generational setting is just completely cut out. This home that is so interesting and intriguing and connects these characters is just gone. And then when it comes to Plain Bad Heroines, it does have a very strong sense of setting, but since we don't really have this connection between the characters, the setting just ends up falling a little flat, even though it is very cool and we do have them all existing there. And in that sense, it does bolster the story a little bit where we see them all dealing with this curse in the same setting because they're not connected it just it still falls a little flat we definitely see the best use of setting in the vanishing half it has one sister grow up there live her entire life there and so we see that through line and then we have the other sister coming back and seeing all these changes and i think that is really really impactful storytelling so i think in all these stories the importance of the connection is kind of built in a specific place and by not taking advantage of that place and really using it in the story to its best effect, then you kind of lose something. Lastly, all the books do this to a varying degree of success, but the exploration of character and specifically how one generation and their lives affects the next generation. I think Practical Magic really did a good job of exploring Sally and Jillian and uh, Sally's daughters, but definitely could have used another look at the ants, and I think that would have made it stronger. Plain Bad Heroines definitely really, really delves into all of its characters and where they come from, but because it doesn't have that connection, we don't quite see how one life in the past is necessarily reflecting a life in the present, and it just doesn't quite work as well. And then The Vanishing Half really does a fantastic job of this. I mean, we even get a look at the mother and why she is the way she is because of where she was raised and all of that and you know we we get a good sense of her daughters and their daughters and it's just it's so so well done i really if you're gonna read any of these books read the vanishing half please it is so good i mean read the other ones too they're they're a good time but the vanishing half is just the most well done okay so those are all the notes i have on 
practical magic, plain bad heroines, and the vanishing half, and how they deal with complex generations of women. Um, as you can see, I've definitely lost the light, but this just, it took a while to film, and I didn't properly prepare for that, but if you stuck it out all the way through, I really, really appreciate you, and I hope you enjoyed watching. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. As always, definitely let me know if you enjoy this kind of content, if you want to see some more essay notes, um, title in progress, maybe. I don't know. If you don't like that title, leave me an idea. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you next time.